Hi, everybody. The lecture today is about American Romanticism, and I'll begin with a date range for this. Um, we'll say that American Romanticism begins about 1820, and of course, that's a date that we're already learning. That's the date that uh, Washington Irving begins, initiates this uh, tradition of American literary fiction with the publication of his uh, great work, The Sketchbook of Jeffrey Cran. And uh, Romanticism in America stretches to about 1861, which is the beginning of the Civil War. Of course, its influence extends far beyond that, but these are important dates for us to learn, and I'll talk more about that second one uh, in a little bit. My lecture today has three parts. I'll begin by defining Romanticism, and then I'll answer the question, how is American Romanticism distinctive? And then we will briefly look at three strains of American Romanticism. So let's begin with a definition. Romanticism is the rebellious teenager of the Enlightenment. Now that's my metaphor, not uh, a formal definition, but I think it's helpful. And you might remember that I, I said this to you last year in British Lit, right? Romanticism is the rebellious teenager of the Enlightenment because it inherits some of the Enlightenment ideals, inherits much even, I'd say, from the Enlightenment, but is largely and self-consciously a reaction against the values of the Enlightenment and its artistic movement known as neoclassicism and uh, the Industrial Revolution. And so in that way, the metaphor of the rebellious teenager really fits, inherits a lot, but sees itself as, is aware of itself as, a rebellion against some of the values of its parent movement. More formally, Romanticism can be defined as an artistic, literary, and cultural movement of the late 18th to mid-19th century that reacted against Enlightenment neoclassicism by emphasizing, and then I'll give you here in just a minute, a list of things. But first I want to talk about that date. Of course, the late 18th century would be the late 1700s, and didn't I just tell you 1820? Well, yes, I did, because Romanticism is a Western artistic and intellectual cultural movement, right? So it begins in Europe in the late 1700s, and a date that's often uh, used to, that uh, to, uh, as a good starting point for this, um, is 1789, the uh, French Revolution. The French Revolution, a quintessential, uh, or it's seen as a quintessential um, romantic revolution, in contrast to the American Revolution, which I'll get to in a bit. And then it comes to Europe, uh, uh, to England rather, and a date that's often used there is 1798, which is the publication of Wordsworth and Coleridge's Lyrical Ballads, a very important um, uh, landmark work in uh, British poetry. Now, you don't need to know those dates for this course. I'm just giving you kind of a time frame here. 1820 is the one I'd like us to know for American lit. All right, so what is Romanticism emphasizing? Now, this is um, a slide from last year. I don't expect that you've remembered all these details, but I'm not going to go into them in great detail here. I'm just going to, uh, I'm going to rush over them a bit and give you two examples that I think help demonstrate this. So, what is Romanticism reacting against in the Enlightenment? Okay, against the Enlightenment's focus on reason and order. The Romantics elevate emotion and imagination against the Enlightenment's emphasis on laws, both like the laws of society and the laws of nature, and systems, like building abstract models of how uh, societies and, and the natural world work. Well, the Romantics are more interested in nature understood as a wild place, right? An untamed place. And they're more interested not so much in the laws of a, of a good society. I mean, everyone wants a good society, but the Romantics are more interested in that figure on the margins of society. What's her story? Tell us that person's story. That's where the Romantic imagination goes. Um, in a slight shift, I guess, from the Enlightenment focus on careful observation as a way to understand those natural laws or to uh, make those observations about uh, politics and economics and, and government and theology and so on. Uh, the Romantics were much more interested in the individual and telling the individual's experience, right? Rather than a kind of bird's eye view of, um, of society as a whole, right? Now, you notice I did strike that one out, and that's because, of course, science and uh, the 
the kind of scholarship that carefully observes things continues. But uh, in terms of what the artists and the, and, the, and the writers of the period are most interested in, uh, there's a shift from that kind of bird's eye careful observation to the individual, uh, the experience of, of interesting uh, individuals. Okay? And um, uh, again, shifting a bit away from the Enlightenment emphasis on progress. The Romantics very much wanted progress too, but they critiqued the Enlightenment notion of progress in two ways. One, they said it was too slow, right? This kind of, uh, this kind of careful, rational, orderly, harmonious way of taking society forward a careful step at a time. Uh, the, the Romantics were impatient with that kind of progress, and they wanted revolution now. They wanted change now. And that's why something like the French Revolution just captured the imagination of uh, Romantic poets uh, in, in Europe and, and in England. Right? They saw that as people, at the beginning anyway, they saw that as people rising up, the common people, right, uh, rising up and, and taking the rights that belong to them. And they were in love with that movement at the beginning. The second critique that the Romantics make uh, of Enlightenment and especially industrial progress is tied to their love of nature, and that is they have a critique of the costs of industrial progress. Look at what it's doing to the countryside. Look at what it's doing to society. They're noticing masses of people move from... Um, uh, from the country into cities that are, are dirty and, um, and crowded, and they're not happy with the changes that they see following the Industrial Revolution. Okay, so I won't go into too much detail in, uh, other than what I've just said, but I do want to give you two examples here. Um, one way we can see most strongly, I think, in American uh, writing in particular, the difference between Enlightenment thinking and Romantic thinking is the way people used the word nature. How did, what did people mean when they said nature? And so this is very important to us Americans because uh, in our Declaration of Independence, it begins the opening line, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. Well, they should explain why they're doing that, the, uh, the Declaration goes on to say. But notice the way the word nature is used there. It's used in connection in the phrase, the laws of nature, right? It's used in connection to this idea that there exists a natural law. That is a kind of, just like the physical world has, has laws which, uh, which although... Uh, which govern how everything behaves, right? Uh, so too does the, the moral and political world have these laws. That's natural law understanding. That is, that everyone has rights by nature. And uh, the American founders saw themselves as reasserting those natural rights which they had by, by the natural law uh, and which they said had been trampled by uh, King George. Now, in contrast to that, when uh, this is a very famous romantic poem, uh, sorry, painting, and it's called Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog. It's done in 1818. It's not American. Um, I guess I don't actually, I, I would guess the guy is German, but I don't know that. But look at that man there. Look at that painting for a minute. Does that fellow on the right look like he is seeing natural law? in what he's looking out at. Is he seeing this kind of orderly, harmonious set of laws that rationally govern both the physical and the political and the moral universe? No. The Romantics understood the word nature and tended to use the word nature quite differently. So an Enlightenment thinker would mean something like the orderly laws that govern the entire universe, both physical and moral, from the cosmos to the society to the individual. Whereas the Romantic, he wasn't interested or talking about so much orderly laws. Uh, the, the Romantic saw nature as that powerful and unpredictable physical world charged with spiritual energy and meaning in which the individual could discover himself. That's what this wanderer above the sea of fog is doing. He's discovering something about himself as he looks out over uh, the sublime chaos of, uh, of that um, kind of spooky scene, I think, with the fog uh, covering the ground and just some rocks jutting up out of it. 
So my claim here is that the United States, from its birth, was an Enlightenment project. And you can see this, by the way, in the architecture of our, uh, of our capital, right? On the left, you have the White House, and on the right, you have the Capitol building. And notice, these are done in good neoclassical style, so notice the way they're kind of designed like Greek and Roman temples, and they've got, uh, they're, they're, they're harmonious and, and, uh, and uh, symmetrical, and they've got these columns and, and that sort of thing. And you can see it, too, even in the layout of the city of Washington, D.C., this is peak enlightenment right here. You're going to take this kind of um, this this natural uh, place at the joining of two rivers, the Potomac and the eastern branch of the Potomac, and you're going to impose a grid on it. That's classic enlightenment thinking right there. We're going to impose this rational east-west north-south grid with everything um, divided into little squares, right? Um, this also has another quick connection to what we've talked about so far, and that is one of the surveyors that helped do this, that helped lay out Washington, D.C. in this very orderly, rational, harmonious way was the, uh, the great black intellectual Benjamin Banneker. And I've showed you part of this picture before, the part on the left. It comes from the 90s. Um, and showing the many accomplishments of Benjamin Banneker. And we talked about him in connection to a letter he sent to Thomas Jefferson, uh, debating with Jefferson, or really taking Jefferson to task over Jefferson's hypocrisy in supporting slavery. Well, Benjamin Banneker was one of the surveyors that worked on the, uh, the, the layout of Washington, D.C. Now, against that understanding of nature, um, here we go, think for a minute about how the scarlet letter uses nature. How nature, the, the natural world, shows up in the Scarlet Letter, which of course is a classic work of American Romanticism done right in the middle of this period, 1850. In the Scarlet Letter, nature is this wild place outside the laws of the Puritan community. In fact, it is, it's the very fact that it's outside the laws that is so important about the forest, about nature, as it shows up in the Scarlet Letter. And there are lots of other ways that the Scarlet Letter is a classic work of American Romanticism. Um, let's see, think about, um, let's see, the novel's heavy focus on the emotional state of its characters. Its appeal to imagination in bringing in the kind of supernatural and mystical elements, right? Might Pearl be a fairy or demon baby in some way? Might the Scarlet Letter have these supernatural properties? That's something the Romantics love to do, appeal to the imagination with, with, with magical elements of their storytelling, right? Um, and of course, it's focused on an outsider, on a social outcast. Um, yeah, I think that, that will do. Okay, so let's move on to the second part here, and that is how is American Romanticism distinctive. And when I say distinctive, I just mean what makes it different from European or British um, Romanticism. In American Romanticism, we have, and when I say I should clarify distinctive a little bit, that's not to say that no one in Europe was optimistic or anything like that, but these are things that really stand out in American Romanticism. That might be a better way to put it. American Romanticism, for the most part, and in, in the final section, I'll come to some really important clarifications on this, or qualifications, I should say. But American Romanticism, for the most part, is, uh, is energized by this forward-looking optimism. This forward-looking optimism that is uh, fed by rapid expansion of the American nation into new territory. Now look at the date range here, 1820 to 1861. This is the era of the notion called Manifest Destiny. Manifest destiny was the idea that became popular in the middle of the 1800s, uh, saying that it is, um, manifest means it's plain to everybody, and destiny means, well, you know what that means. It's like it's, it's faded, right? It's plain to everybody that it is faded that the American nation will extend from the um, Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. This was the, uh, a popular idea among white Americans, anyway, of the day. That we're just, of course, we're fate. This is, this is going to be our land, right? Um, now that leads me to a pretty important qualification on what I'm calling forward-looking optimism, 
um, and rapid expansion into new territory, and that is, this is an era of great contradictions and tensions too. That optimism, of course, is not universally shared among people who rightly deserve, rightly are included in the label Americans, right? Um, of course, that, that uh, expansion um, depends upon taking land by force from American Indians, right? And uh, we'll get to what black Americans are writing about and thinking about um, both at the end of this lecture and then in a separate lecture on the slave narrative. Um, but that optimism is not universally shared, right? Not even by white authors, which I'll get to again in a third section. Right? But for the most part, there is, uh, there is this optimism as uh, the possibilities. Well, let, me, let me see if I can give an example of this, of how that might. I don't know how you guys feel about what your prospects are for life after graduation. But I remember uh, teaching uh, right in the middle of what's been called now the Great Recession, uh, which began in 2008 and, you know, went for the next, I don't know, six, eight years or something like that. And I remember talking to a lot of seniors who were, had what, what economists call a scarcity mindset, right? They were not so optimistic that once they graduated from high school and went out and went through four years of college, what were they going to end up with? A good job? That was not happening for a whole lot of people. There were a whole lot of people, and everybody knew these stories, graduating from uh, uh, with good grades in high school and still just unable to find a job and now saddled with lots of debt, right? There was not a lot of forward-looking optimism at that time in American life. Now imagine if instead you knew that when you graduated from college, if you were willing to work hard and put yourself in a little bit of risk, sure, but work hard, you were guaranteed a... A, a good livelihood, right? Let's say you're guaranteed a job that starts at a really impressive salary. It's going to be tough. It's not going to be an easy job. But you can make, let's say, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 right out of college. Those jobs are just ready for you. They're there for the asking if you want them. Now, there's something similar going on at the time in, uh, in American politics and history. And that is the, uh, the United States government is just giving away land in the West to people who want it, to white people who want it. And that's an important qualification. You had to be white to, to uh, qualify for this program, which was called the, um, the Donation Land Claim Act, right? But you could get 320 acres of land, or 640 if you were a married couple who was white. And that, that's a lot of land. You can do it. Land was, and in a lot of ways still is, wealth, right? That's... Um, everything that we, we grow and we eat uh, comes from land. So this sense of, this uh, rising sense of nationalism and, uh, and uh, this sense of, of possibility as the, the country seems to uh, white Americans in the East to be opening up to the West, um, it really affects the, the mood of uh, writing at the time. Now, I should say there's a second way that there is a uh, contradiction in this period because at the same time uh, that we have writers speaking and writing with this kind of optimism, you have great concern about the growing divide in the country uh, over the issue of slavery. So that's what I mean when I say this is a period of great of, of conflict and tension. Um, nevertheless, I think it's fair to qualify it as a, a a time of forward-looking optimism. Now, what do I mean by democratic idealism? This right here is Andrew Jackson, the seventh American president, and he was elected in 1828. He was the first uh, presidential candidate of the new Democratic Party in America. A new party comes to power in the 1828 election under a new governing philosophy. You see, when America was founded, it was not actually founded as a democracy. You might have heard this before. It was founded as a republic. And to the founders, that, there was an important distinction there. You see, a democracy gave power to lots of people. And a republic gave power to just uh, selected elites from among the people. And so you have James Madison in Federalist Number 10 saying, democracies have ever been spec spectacles of turbulence and contention. If you just let everybody decide on questions, he was not so sure that's a good idea. And instead, he says, a republic, by which I mean a government in which a scheme of representation takes place, right? That is, the common people are represented by those who are supposed to be the best among them. He 
You also have John Adams saying something similar. Remember, democracy never lasts long, he says. There never was a democracy that did not commit suicide. So the prior to about 1828, the governing political philosophy in America um, did not want to extend civic power to as many people as possible. They wanted to keep it to uh, the, the right kind of people, a certain kind of people, they might say. Right, but with this new, oh, let me go back here. With this new um, party rising to power, comes also a number of changes in American uh, politics and civic life. Let me read a quote to you from the Digital History Project of the University of Houston. Between 1820, so which is our date here, and 1840, a revolution took place in American politics. In most states, property qualifications for voting and office holding were repealed. That is, you didn't have to own property anymore in order to be able to vote. Now, that's a, that's a massive opening up of the vote to uh, white Americans. You don't have to be a property owner anymore, right? Uh, there were also other changes where there was direct selection rather than representative or indirect selection. Uh, because of these and other political innovations, voter participation skyrocketed. By 1840, voting participation had reached unprecedented levels. Nearly 80% of adult white males went to the polls. 80% of people voted by 1840. So that's what I mean by democratic idealism. Democratic idealism is this new idea in the 19th century that the wisdom of the common man can in fact be trusted. And society is better when more people participate. All right, this, uh, a second uh, distinctive feature of American Romanticism is this enduring stock character uh, that um, is called the American Everyman. Now, I'll give an example of this in a minute. The American Everyman is, is a figure that's uh, created by and fed by this rising nationalism, this romantic trust in the individual that we've been talking about. And well, what is that figure? What is that stock character? The, uh, the common American, the common kind of working class American, uh, is treated in literature as the best kind of person to be, right? The best of both worlds. Uh, this common everyday uh, working class American is more civilized than that old romantic figure of the noble savage, which we talked about last year, right? He's more civilized than that noble savage, but has the best of his qualities, his kind of rustic, authentic connection to nature, right? And he's more rugged than those kind of um, urbane and, and limp-wristed Europeans, uh, but he still has their, the best of their civilization. So it's a best of both worlds kind of character, right? That's maybe halfway in between that noble savage and that uh, urbane European. <clears throat> this period of, uh, of, never mind, I don't need to talk about that quote. Okay, so one of the enduring figures that we, uh, a great example of this, um, I will actually get to in a minute. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll read first this quote uh, from a scholar. John Greenleaf Whittier sang of farmers, lumbermen, and shoemakers, of migrants and the poor. Emerson learned wisdom from strong-natured farmers. And Henry David Thoreau listened to rude Yankees, whom he exuberantly described as fuller of talk and rare adventure in sun and rain than a chestnut is of meat. Greater men than Homer or Chaucer or Shakespeare, only they never got time to say so. There's democratic idealism for you right there. There's the figure of the American every band. The farmer, the lumberman, the shoemaker, the migrant, the poor, the rude, strong-natured Yankee farmer, they can, uh, they can be uh, greater men than Homer, Chaucer, or Shakespeare. All right, skip that example. Um, we, get a, we get a really great uh, example of this type of character from uh, the writer James Fenimore Cooper. This is a famous painting uh, called um, Washington Irving and His Literary Friends at Sunnyside. And remember I told you about Irving, who's sitting there in the middle, that he uh, invited authors over and, uh, and coached them and, and encouraged them and had them for dinner parties and conversations and things like that. And um, one other uh, famous author from the period is the man James Fenimore Cooper. James Fenimore Cooper wrote a series of novels through the 1820s to 1840s that feature the first American action hero. That's my term for him, uh, Natty Bumpo. Kind of an odd name, 
but maybe that's why he goes by so many nicknames in the books. In the first one, he's called Leatherstocking. Probably the most famous of the books is Last of the Mohicans. He's called Hawkeye in that one, the Trapper, Pathfinder, Deerslayer. It's a story that we have loved in American literature to tell again and again and again. Now, how does he best represent this, um, uh, this American everyman figure? Let's see. Well, he is a, uh, he's a white man, and that's important to this character type. He's a white man, but he's uh, orphaned, and he's raised among the Indians. And so he learns their, he, he, he learns their connection with the forest, their, uh, their woodcraft, their ability to, to track and to be stealthy in the forest. Um, he has an Indian blood brother that he goes on adventures with. Um, he is, uh, but he has been uh, educated by a white missionary, right? So he has that authentic connection to the forest, and he has that access to... Uh, to European learning um, that way. He is, why do I call him an action hero? Because he's like, he's great at everything. He's a crack shot in ridiculous ways that Mark Twain later will go on to make fun of. We'll talk about that when we get there. But he's like an impossibly good shot with a rifle. I think he coins the phrase, Cooper coins the phrase, one shot, one kill. Natty Bumpo says that about his ability with a rifle. He's good in a fist fight. Uh, he can track anybody who's been lost, that kind of thing. Right? And it's a story we've loved to tell again and again. Uh, we've told it in so many different film versions, 1920, 24, 32, 36. Here's a 72 BBC film version. Um, this one is fantastic. I, I hope we get a chance to watch it together. Um, I usually do with classes. Uh, the Last of the Mohicans with Daniel Day-Lewis done in 1992. In 2007, so there hasn't been another version of the movie, of the story that I'm aware of, uh, but there was a comic book series that uh, Marvel put out retelling the story in graphic novel form in 2007. All right. And let's finish by talking about three strains of American romanticism. And uh, these are my terms here, so I'm, I'm trying to uh, capture some generalizations, I guess. We have the bright strain of American romanticism, which is which is what I've been talking about so far. This is the predominant strain. It is optimistic, it's forward-looking, it has high trust in the ordinary individual. But there's also a second strain of American Romanticism among white American authors. There is this dark strain of Romanticism that tends to be pessimistic and inward-looking and focuses on darkness, sin, sorrow, madness. These are the stories of Edgar Allan Poe. We'll read several of those. He's an American romantic, right? These are the stories of Nathaniel Hawthorne, who doesn't come across as a particularly kind of optimistic. Uh, his focus is not so much high trust in the individual, but this reminder that uh, sin and darkness are in every human soul, right? Um, Herman Melville, when we get to Moby Dick, Moby Dick I think he purposely perfectly balances these two strains. Okay, and a third strain that comes out of American Romanticism deserves its own lecture and we'll get it later in the course, and that is the slave narrative. Over this period of time, there are about a, more, between 100 and 150 different narratives that are published by uh, formerly enslaved black Americans who escape from slavery and then tell their story uh, to, to the nation. And um, there are in, there's an influence of uh, American Romanticism on the way these stories are told, right? Uh, there's that um, interest in uh, the, the individual's experience and story is used as a powerful and moving argument against the kind of, um, uh, well, racist narratives that are being created about black inferiority at the time in order to uh, justify the continued enslavement of black Americans, right? So the slave narrative begins a little bit earlier than the Romantic period. We looked at uh, some of Alado Equiano's, and that's written in 1789, but it is the, the 19th century, the 1800s, that sees a real explosion of these kinds of stories. Uh, we will look at a long excerpt from Frederick Douglass's, that's the man at the top left, uh, one of the most brilliant writers in all of American literature and history, and one of its most powerful orators as well. Uh, we started the year with a little excerpt from Harriet Jacobs, that's uh, her painting on the bottom left, 
and then you might have seen the movie or heard of the movie, 12 Years a Slave, which is a true story based on another of these slave narratives by a man named Solomon Northup. Um, and we'll talk about uh, the slave narrative more later, a very important genre of American writing. All right, so American Romanticism, 1820 to 1861. Um, as I said, its influence continues beyond 1861, but the advent of the American Civil War is a death knell to that kind of um, forward-looking nationalism and optimism. Um, uh, writing American uh, literature and letters changes a great deal in the second half of the 19th century. We'll talk about that when we get to realism, our next uh, literary movement lecture. And in part, uh, I, I want to leave you with a sense of understanding of why this might be. The picture here is from, uh, it was painted in 1887, but it's of the Battle of Antietam, which took place in 1862, so still early in the Civil War. Um, on that day, 23,000 Americans, north and south, died. By contrast, in all of the um, Revolutionary War, 6,800 Americans died. In the entire Revolutionary War, 6,800 Americans died on one day in the Civil War. The bloodiest day of the war, to be sure, but nevertheless, on one day, 23,000 Americans died. We'll talk more about this um, when we talk about uh, realism, but it, it is a huge perspective shift for American writers. Okay, everybody, take care.